delighted to have uh, a, a very uh, unique uh, person to give the opening, a welcoming uh, keynote. And I was thinking about it, uh, when we have sp real spaceships to uh, develop the solar system and eventually when we have starships, we're going to need um, a captain to tell everyone what to do. And um, it happens that uh, there's a man here who uh, knows all about that because uh, he spent quite a few years in the most advanced encapsulated human uh, operations in the world with the highest technology uh, known as a nuclear submarine. And uh, he, uh, uh, after that, uh, became president and chief uh, executive officer of um, Consolidated Nuclear S Security, which uh, is responsible for management and operation of both the uh, Y-12 National Security Complex and the Pantex plant. And some of you know that all of the fuel throughout the history of uh, the nuclear uh, fleet has come up through uh, Y-12 and, uh, and its affiliated uh, companies. And so uh, they know everything here about how to develop enriched uranium and use it for uh, state-of-the-art uh, applications. The, um, uh, he, prior to that, was a Bechtel executive, might still be, and um, he uh, joined CNS, Consolidated Nuclear Services, in 2014 to serve as chief operating officer and manage all the operations of these uh, plants here. He has more than 36 years of prior technical and management leadership experience with the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program. He planned and implemented the consolidation of the Bettis Atomic Power Laboratory and the Knowles Atomic Power Laboratory in, into a single organization. And in, in 2014, uh, he applied that experience to initiate the consolidation of Pantex and Y-12 under one uh, DOE contract. Um, his career has been focused on uh, leading discipline nuclear operations and improving performance in high-risk environments. His technical background includes design, development, and fabrication of reactor control drive mechanisms, steam generators, and refuel equipment. He holds a BS uh, in civil engineering from the Penn State University and completed various uh, project management and leadership development programs with Westinghouse, Bechtel, and the University of Michigan. It's a great honor to introduce uh, Morgan Smith. Thank you, Dr. Rather. Very generous introduction. And thank you all for inviting me here. I didn't come with a request, but now I think I have one, seeing that hook. The employees of Y-12 would like very much for that hook to remain to yank me from time to time when I'm making presentations. So I would ask that that exit the facility <laughs> at the end of this. But you're gathered here during a very historic time in this valley. This is a year of reflection on a number of major of achievements that have occurred as a result of the work in this valley. And my goal is to give you a little bit of that history and hopefully have that inspire you with what you're thinking about and where you're trying to take technology and collaborative innovation. And so it's interesting for me that I would be standing here speaking to you as you talk about the goal of human development of our solar system, given my background, which was more under the sea for most of that time. But when I think of the solar system, I go back almost 50 years ago. I still remember Christmas Eve, 1968. I'm sitting in my home in the living room watching some amazing pictures on the TV. Apollo 8 gave us grainy images, but they were historic because man had orbited the moon for the first time, and we were looking back 
on earth with those pictures. As a nation, we had closely followed the work of NASA during that period. President Kennedy declared that our country, the United States, would send a man to the moon by the end of the decade, by the end of the 60s. And frankly, we hoped before the Soviets. As a student of leadership, I've often reflected on that deliberate and profound vision of a president, willing to make a bold statement to give us a daring vision, because it had so many powerful elements to it, elements that I think you're going to talk about this week, a pursuit of revolutionary technology and how you apply that, the courage to press against that, which is very unforgiving, the elements of space, a willingness to ask men and women to tackle what was, before that time, seemingly impossible. And then at least within that period, a race to beat a national enemy in the interest of demonstrating that the American way was a superior approach to life on this planet and in space. That moment hooked American citizenry. And it hooked, in my mind, a generation of people. As we thought about what was going to happen, we followed the advancements. We were encouraged by the advancements. We were challenged by it. President Kennedy referred to it as a great new American enterprise. And with that captivation, a generation became fascinated in engineering and science and how it might influence our world. When I was growing up, we didn't have STEM programs. We had NASA. I don't think we needed them at that time. We were challenged by what we were seeing before our eyes, and it awakened a generation to pursue through all different types of angles what was possible and where they could take or world. Ultimately, Apollo 8 paved the way for Apollo 11. And a mere seven months later, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on that moon and had that piece of history. Now, how does that relate to the Tennessee Valley? How does that relate to where we are? Well, NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center is in Huntsville, Alabama. It's there. It provided the Saturn V rockets that propelled Armstrong, Aldrin, and Michael Collins out of this atmosphere into the history books. When I look at the Tennessee Valley, though, it's a lot more than 50 years ago in Huntsville, Alabama. If you go back 75 years, you have the formation of where we are, Oak Ridge. If you go back 85 years, you have the Tennessee Valley Authority. And those are the anniversaries that we're also celebrating this year here in this valley. I grew up in Pennsylvania. I remember going to school and learning about the Tennessee Valley Authority. It was presented as a huge accomplishment, a significant accomplishment. And frankly, the significance of that accomplishment is a whole lot more impressive to me today living in this beautiful valley than it was then when I heard about it in the classroom. And it's actually hard to imagine this area without TVA. Without it, I wonder how long this region would have languished under the hardships of the Great Depression. Would NASA and the Department of Defense have major facilities in Huntsville, Alabama for some of their most important work for this country? Would K-25 and Y-12 and Oak Ridge National Lab be here without TVA? And would the region now be home to so many international automotive and other manufacturing type facilities? 
And then would the skilled, high-tech workers be here again without TVA? TVA was a game changer, no doubt about it. And it enabled each ensuing technical accomplishment and contribution to this valley to occur. In fact, that plentiful supply of power was a key reason that then 10 years later, Oak Ridge was selected for the Manhattan Project and the important work that was so top secret at that time. And that made this valley home to a very improbable scientific and technological achievement. Less than a decade after scientists discovered the capability of nuclear fission, Americans' ingenuity and determination built a bomb. A bomb that, in harnessing the atom, changed the world. But when you think of this valley and the massive facilities that were constructed in secret, and what was enabled with the design and the application of that technology, it was a global impact. It was a global influence. And since that time, while certainly the nuclear arsenal was something to be much respected, and frankly, if used, much feared, it has been a deterrent. It has completely changed how the world interacts since its development and inception. And so it has, in fact, been that deterrent. It has greatly reduced lost lives in world conflict since its time, as you can see, in a very, very dramatic way. And then, interestingly enough, a year after the war ended, Admiral Rickover came here, and he studied nuclear power. He looked at it from a different perspective. How can we use it for naval propulsion? How can it be the game changer there? And I would say that as you're gathered here this morning, that we can learn anything from Admiral Rickover, it is the fact that in this valley, great things get started and great things follow from what is done here. And so being here together this week, you're actually looking at a pretty bold vision. You're looking at some things to accomplish that within a decade or so, today, are part of what we read in science fiction or what we see in the movies. To me, that's energizing because you're going to be exploring what is possible and what needs to be made possible to put people into our solar system in a very far-reaching way. And so I would say that if our prior history in this valley is any prologue, you've come to the right place. This is a great place to come together, discuss it, focus it, and then go forth in accomplishment. Because this is a place of transformative projects. It has been throughout its history. Each one of those accomplishments that I've mentioned, TVA, Manhattan Project, Apollo 8, they're unique, they're historic, but together they speak to something much greater in the American enterprise. And they highlight to me what are seemingly impossible outcomes that can occur when we focus, when the government lays out a vision, when we as the people and we as industry bring our talents to bear to accomplishment, and then we see it through to completion. And I think when we think about this legacy, it's up to us now. How are we going to build on that? What are we going to do to ensure that talented and dedicated people that follow us have accomplishments that they talk about 50 and 75 and 85 years from now? That's what we need to focus on. And I think that when we come together and we leverage the collective capabilities that we have 
around a singular purpose with a unified vision and a unified drive and a passion. You're here because of passion for what you do. The sky's the limit. And so, as I start winding down, I'd like you to consider how you might build on this proud heritage. This heritage that has been a world changer. Those that have come before us, they tackled grand challenges. They served our nation. And they literally changed the world in our lifetime. That's what they were able to accomplish. From the Cold War to the space race, to today's alliances, and differing international partnerships, the world interacts differently because of what has been done in this proud valley. Now, I'd like to make it just a little bit more personal on my part. So I grew up in the east, northeast. I can remember in elementary school learning how to hide under desks for air raid drills. We were concerned. We were afraid that we'd be attacked on our own soil by the former Soviet Union. And they were a formidable enemy. After college, I went to work in the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program. At that time, we were trying to win a Cold War. The pace was furious. The demands extensive. The same was going on here at Y-12 in this valley and the work in the laboratory. Collectively as an enterprise, we worked together to win that war. And during that entire time, going to the country of Russia is something I never thought about, and frankly, I never wanted to do. I was proud to be an American. But through the dedicated efforts of so many, we won the Cold War. We won it without firing a shot. The deterrent did its job for the world. And so I now fast forward to 2003, and I find myself in Russia, a place I never wanted to go. Why am I in Russia? I'm there to bring a child out of that country and adopt him as a full United States citizen. He's graduated from high school now. He served with Congressman Duncan in Washington this summer, learning more about how he might serve the country in the future. He's away at college. But my son is visible evidence to me, my family, and now all of you that the work we've done in this valley has literally changed the world. It has done that. And in him, I experience daily, when I get home, a greeting. What to me was unthinkable in the past, I'm greeted by a Russian in my house. <laughs> That's world changing. That's different. And so we have the unique opportunity, and I would say responsibility collectively, to carry that kind of legacy forward. The question is, will we rise to the challenge? Can we break through the technical and bureaucratic barriers that stand in our way? Can we find solutions that we seek? Who will our work inspire? NASA inspired a generation at that time. And look what that generation accomplished. What will be our global impact? And you know what? Maybe, just maybe, if we get the right things in motion, we'll change this world in ways that we can't even anticipate. Go back to 85 years ago. Think about those that were working on TVA. They had no idea that in 10 years in this valley, we would build a bomb, that it would be selected to win a world war. No idea whatsoever. Those that worked on the bomb, had no idea that they would be changing the world in the way that a grand challenge would come out to put a man on the moon. Those that worked on putting a man on the moon had no idea that they would unleash a generation of technology and capability 
that literally were so life-changing in so many ways as the side but tremendous benefit of the work that they did. And then finally, frankly, none of them would have had any idea that you'd have a skinny man standing in front of you this morning that has come to this valley with an adopted son out of a country that when he was growing up, he thought he'd never go to. We don't know what our contributions will yield. We have no idea. But, well, we can't predict it. I do know that in the end, what we work on and our contributions are much greater than what it yields for ourselves. As history proves, in this valley, we're part of something much larger than what takes place in this Tennessee Valley. And so, we are stage setters, and you're here this week to set a stage for future generations, for our nation, and literally for the world. So we need to work together. We need to expand these contributions. We can brag about the past. This past is something to be very proud of. But you know what? It's just that. It is the past. The question is, what are we going to do with the day and the days ahead? What are we going to create? that those will look at with marvel and say, look at how this group banded together to do yet other impossible things. What will they say 50 years from now? What will they say 75, 85 years from now? What will be our contributions? You're talking about something that echoes President Kennedy's vision, putting men and women on Mars. What a vision. What a purpose. What a drive. And so I hope you enjoy your time here in Oak Ridge. I hope you enjoy your time here in this symposium. And that it's a great symposium. In fact, my greatest privilege and pleasure out of it would be that it's a world-changing symposium. Use the time well. For those that have gone before us have passed on to us the baton, to continue the drive, the development, and the accomplishment that has gone before us in shaping the future. It's in our hands. The question is, what will we do with the time, talent, and treasure entrusted to us? That's the question to answer this week and in the days ahead for all of us assembled here. Thank you. Have a great symposium. You see, that's very powerful stuff. I think you'll all agree. And uh, the, the challenge is real. And we see what it takes to accomplish real things like this is leadership. And I don't think there's a better example than uh, our speaker just now. So uh, let's do things that will engender that kind of leadership and, and make people uh, enthusiastic and believe, believe in it so that we can actually achieve it.